Well, we are in Acts chapter 1 this morning, Acts chapter 1, verse 12. I really appreciate um, our staff, all the hard work they've put into uh, getting us to be able to come together and the, the uh, things they prepare. As a staff, we're going through uh, Philippians right now uh, in our weekly uh, staff meeting. And so we, we talked this week how there's this, uh, this issue that comes up. We have in, in, in Philippians chapter 4, uh, Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. But in Philippians chapter 2, verse 28, he said that he was anxious for the church as he was sending uh, Maphrodites uh, to the church. And so uh, you, you see there that he's saying, he gives this biblical imperative, don't be anxious. But at the same time, he's saying he is anxious. And so uh, we talked as a church, just the different things that cause anxiety. Some people, uh, anxiety is caused by money. Some people, it's caused by the future, just not knowing. Uh, For some people, it would be their health or their sickness. Uh, Some would be their possessions. For me personally, uh, the thing that I have a lot of anxiety over uh, would be relationships. It's it's really hard for me whenever I feel like I've offended somebody or uh, kind of hurt their feelings. Uh, so two things to say about that. One is uh, today is Father's Day, so uh, thank you, fathers, for all the hard, hard work you you put into your family. Uh, I know there are some fathers who would rather be a friend than the dad, and there's a saying that uh, says that if you if you're a good father and you raise your children, you'll raise a good friend. But if you try to be a friend, you'll spend the rest of your life raising your children. So uh, you know you want to parent, you want to take those responsibility. Then secondly. As a pastor, I fall into this trap of wanting to please people uh, because ultimately what I do as a pastor is stand up, preach God's word, and then call people to repentance. And that naturally is not going to set well with people to, to say there's sin in our own lives. And so uh, my childhood pastor, he said, you know, our job will always be offensive. It, it, it will just, it comes with the job. You call people to repentance. So with that, we love the truth, don't we? We, we love the light uh, unless the light shines on our darkness. Then we don't like the light. Then, you know, that's kind of what we see in the culture. Everybody loves the truth unless you disagree about the truth and then they don't like it. You you could see this really well with John the Baptist. Now, I don't know if you remember this or not, but in Mark chapter 6, verse 20, it said that Herod enjoyed listening to John the Baptist preach. So if you could think about that, he, he loved hearing John the Baptist. Was, he was like, oh, this guy's great, until John started preaching about marriage. And then it cost John his head, didn't it? And so we see that tendency. Uh, my friend Lynn Rodre, he, he's the one who I first heard quote this verse whenever we would go uh, street witnessing down at Mardi Gras. He would tell people, Galatians 4, 16, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? And that's a great thought. Like, listen, I'm, I'm just trying to tell you what the truth is. And so uh, it will be the natural tendency. It should be in some regards that as we preach through God's word, there'll be some weeks that you say, man, that was a great sermon. I love that. There'll be other weeks that you say, that guy's a jerk. I mean, he was like calling me out. And so let me, let me just share a couple things with you. One is uh, there'll be times that I'm wrong and, and I'll need correction. Uh, and so there'll be times that I share my opinion. I, I will uh, strive. I pray that I don't do that. Uh, but then also I want you to know there'll be sermons uh, that you'll need to hear and it may be light shining on some dark areas that you need correction. And so um, I will tell you, I won't ever try to single anyone out because my experience is normally uh, you try to like preach a sermon for this person to get it and they don't get it. And then the person who's actually you know, doing it, like if we preached on humility, most of the time the pride-filled people would be like, oh, that was a good sermon. And then the most humble person in the church will say, man, I, I need to be more humble, right? You, you have this soul winner, you preach on witnessing and they're like, man, you're right. I got to get out there and share the gospel. And you think, I don't know how you could do more. You'd share the gospel all the time, right? That's kind of the natural tendency of what happens. So I will tell you that as your pastor, uh, I'll, I'll try to balance just preaching the truth and kind of um, letting the cards do, uh, you know, fall as they may. Um, but I'll also preach hardest for, to myself. I'll study a subject all week long, and I'll probably be much more offended at what I find the wickedness in my own life than in yours. So we'll ask the Holy Spirit to be the one that guides us to the truth. So again, have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? It's the Spirit that leads us to the truth, and so that's, I believe, would be a fitting way for us to pray as we come together each week. Lord, would your Spirit guide me to the truth? Would you sanctify me? Would you make me like Christ by the truth? So that's all an introduction that really has nothing to do with the sermon. So we're in Acts chapter 1 now. If you would, stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. It says this, Acts chapter 1, verse 12. 
Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which was near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. When they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren. A gathering of about 120 persons was there together. And he said, Brethren, the scripture must be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in the ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and his intestines gushed out. And it became known to all who lived in Jerusalem, so that in their own language, that field was called Hekeldema, that is, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate, and let no one dwell in it, and let another man take his office. Therefore, it's necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John, until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us, Of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and and Matthias. And they prayed, or Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. Which one of these two have you chosen to occupy this ministry? And for apostleship, from which Judas had turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias. And he was added to the 11 apostles. Father, we ask that you would speak to our hearts today. Father, would your words be powerful and effective? Father, I pray that it would be your words and your truth ultimately that would shape us. Of all the things in this world that want to mold us, may it be your word. Father, would you speak to our hearts today? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, today the message is called Praying for One. So you look at this church, there's going to be multiple times, five different times in this passage that you see the word one appear. So we're in Acts chapter one and we're praying for one. So that's, it's just all these times that they're, they're coming together with the one. So first is, this is their very first church service. And so they're, pr- they're coming together for one reason. And what is the reason that they're coming together? It's for prayer. You think if we were going to open a church, in fact, there are churches that are opening here in Springfield, um, you know, where, where somebody will come together as a church planter and say, let's start a church and what do they normally do uh, to start a church or or what would we do if we were replanting our church we might say let's do a block party let's try to get a crowd together let's maybe offer some pizza pizza is always good or spaghetti if you like spaghetti if you said that maybe we'll have cats and dogs I don't know what we're doing here but you know we're going to try to get everybody together you know if it's a youth ministry we'd say let's go play laser tag for our first time together or uh, you know maybe have a big concert but ultimately the church they were gathering for one purpose and that purpose was prayer. Somebody said, I've said it from the pulpit before, that the church began in devoted prayer, but it'll probably die in a potluck. Like the church was devoted to prayer. So whenever they gathered together, there was one thing on their agenda and it was prayer. They said, let's come together and we're going to pray. We'll talk about the specific things they're praying for here in just a moment. But if you just look at prayer in the book of Acts, it's unbelievable. In fact, here's a quote from one of the commentaries. Prayer plays a significant role in the story of Acts as recorded uh, here for us in the Bible. The believers prayed for guidance in making decisions in Acts chapter 1. They prayed for courage in Acts chapter 4. They prayed as part of their daily ministry in chapter 2, 3, and 6. Stephen prayed as he was stoned. Peter prayed along with John for the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. Saul of Tarsus prayed at his conversion. Peter prayed for Dorcas uh, to be raised from the dead. Cornelius prayed that God would show him how to be saved. And then Peter was praying whenever God spoke to him and told him to go to Cornelius. And that's just the first 10 chapters. We could go literally almost every chapter in the book of Acts talks about how the church was praying. Of all things we could say about the early church, we could say they were a praying people. The commentary goes on and says this, prayer is both the thermometer and the thermostat of the local church. For the spiritual temperature either goes up or down depending on how God's people pray. So you think you, you could look at prayer and say you could tell what the, how, uh, how the love of God was moving in people. 
But you could also look at prayer to say, how is it going to move in people? So you see the illustration between the temperature and the thermostat. So the people, whenever they came together, they were coming together for one purpose, and that was prayer. But then when you look at how they pray, they pray, it says, with one mind. So verse 14, they were all with one mind. They were continually devoting themselves to prayer. We talked just a couple weeks about uh, weeks ago about how in the midst of a very diverse early church that you had, everything from the tax collector to the zealot who would want to kill the tax collector to the fishermen, the ruffigans, and uh, you even have Judas in there and, and what all of this looks like. By the time it comes to the early church, you realize they're very desert, diverse. The the way they had unity was that they were looking to the Lord. They weren't looking at each other, and uh, they were ultimately looking up instead of looking around. Uh, they weren't just passing time. They were all in. They were devoted to it. They were, uh, this wasn't just something they did occasionally. They were devoted to prayer, to coming together with one mind. Now, what was their prayer request? Ultimately, number three, if you're taking notes, would be this. They're praying for one man. They weren't just blessing the food. This wasn't just a moment of transition during the the Sunday morning time together. They weren't praying over the offering, although I'm sure they did. They weren't taking prayer requests for the sick. Ultimately, what they were praying for is for this one man, verse 24. And they prayed and they said, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. Show us which one of these two you've chosen to occupy this ministry. Now, the question would be posed, why is it that they're praying for one person? And if you've got two equally qualified uh, people and they don't have any budget restrictions, why not just take both of them? I mean, they're both great guys. Justice was uh, in all ways shown to be equal to Matthias, right? And so uh, you have these two guys, why not have 13? Why does the number 12 so important? Well, you'd have to look back at Luke chapter 12. Jesus says that these 12 apostles apostles are going to sit on 12 thrones, and they're going to judge the 12 tribes of Israel. And so ultimately, they're going to pick a 12th person because whenever they receive the Holy Spirit and they go out to witness to Israel, it's going to kind of complete the the role that they were supposed to do, that they're going to now be the official witnesses to Israel. So somebody would ask, well, why why didn't they pick another apostle whenever James dies uh, later on in the book of Acts? I believe is that uh, maybe around uh, I, I don't remember the exact place, but whenever James dies, when he's martyred, why didn't they pick another person? Well, because they had the 12 witnesses. That time has been fulfilled. So they're looking for one man who would be the official witness to act as the official judge that the gospel had gone to all of Israel. Then we see, of course, it goes on to all of the Gentiles. So uh, just a little bit of review here. They're gathering for one reason, that's prayer. They were praying with one mind. They were praying for one man. And this man they were praying for really had just one qualification. They're looking for somebody, you think of all the qualifications. I know whenever they asked the search committee to, came, to come together to, to select me as your pastor, I know that they had a list that said they want somebody who's good looking, who's athletic, who's a natural leader, who's funny and They couldn't find that guy, so you got me, right? So, uh, you know, all the things that we would put together in our list, if we'd say, here's what we're looking for, ultimately, they were looking somebody who had one qualification, and the qualification was that he had walked with Jesus. Look at verse 21. Therefore, it's necessary that of the men who've accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us. So ultimately, they're looking from from the baptism until the ascension. They say, we want somebody who is with us during that time. Now, imagine this for just a moment, that this is a person, uh, ultimately what they wanted was someone who could be an eyewitness. We read in the Gospel of John that not all the books in all the world could compare or could contain all that Jesus did. Remember, that's the way John ends that Gospel. And so we have all of these events, and ultimately what they're saying, what Peter's saying is, we don't want somebody who's giving secondhand testimony. We want somebody who could say, I was with Jesus. I saw what happened. I was there whenever he called Lazarus back from the dead. I, I, w- I was there whenever he raised the paralyzed man to walk. I saw this with my own eyes. It wasn't just a story that I heard, but I was a personal witness. And we do this in our own court of law, don't we? We don't ask for secondhand testimony. We don't say, uh, I wasn't there, I didn't see it, but I have a friend who told me what he saw. That would, of course that would be thrown out. We need somebody who's an actual eyewitness. This is a person that must have walked with Jesus. In fact, look at what it says that from the time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, the picture there is that he's weaving. 
that he's around. It's, they mingled with Jesus. So we don't have all of the things that Jesus did in those three years, but this person was amongst them in that time. He wasn't just a visitor occasionally, but he walked with Jesus. So he was able to give, this would be the next thing. So he, they, they were looking for this, this, one, uh, this one thing that he had. And that was that he had walked with Jesus. I remember whenever Nick came in view of a call, uh, what Josh said, he said, ultimately what we want to see is, is this a man who's walked with Jesus? That was the qualification they were looking for. And then the last thing, number five, this man was going to be, have one responsibility. You think of all the things the early church needed, uh, clearly there were some organizational things they needed. Where are we going to meet? Where are we going to fit all the people? You know, first time Peter preaches and there are thousands that are saved. And so there's going to need to be some organization structure. We get that in Acts chapter 6. There are some people that didn't get the food. And so you think about uh, all the administrative roles they have to do for our church. Maybe somebody has to print the bulletins, unlock the doors, and uh, clean the bathrooms, clean the pews before the service begins. Of all the things that could be done, what is the one responsibility they want to give this man? Verse 22, one of these must become a witness. Ultimately, what's the one thing they're asking this man to do? He is to become a witness about Christ, specifically the resurrection. This man had a mission now. His mission was to share that God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, that Christ died as a ransom for all, that all men were equal in the sight of God. They were all sinners. They all needed a savior, and God sent the one man who could save them. He not only died on the cross, but he rose from the grave. Now think whenever they they had this ministry, it was a ministry of witnessing from personal experience. Who better to talk about doubt than Thomas? Because Thomas had dealt with doubt and had personally touched the Savior. So he could say, oh, I, I too struggled with that. And then I saw Jesus. Who better could talk about grace and mercy than Peter, who he himself had denied Christ and yet received mercy even in spite of that? Who who better could talk about remaining in Christ than John, who we believe leaned back against Christ during the Lord's Supper, right? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Who's going to write about love the most? John. Who's the person who said, I'm not telling you something that's theoretical. I'm telling you something that I've experienced. I wrote this, this down. How could you tell of grace if you had not received it? But if you had received grace... How could you not tell of it? Ultimately, that's the point. That, that this man, Matthias, he's going he's gonna to have his mind and his heart so filled with what Christ does, had done that clearly you, you don't have to question what are you going to talk about. He's going to talk about what he saw, what he experienced, right? Remember the way 1 John is written. 1 John, he says, that was we've seen, which we've touched, which we've heard, which we beheld. He's saying, I'm an eyewitness to this. And of course, they pick the, the way the story ends, they pick by the casting of lots, which by the way is the last time that's used in scripture. Uh, it's talked about in Proverbs, it just kind of interesting fact that the Lord controls the dice, essentially the, uh, controls the, the lot. And so what they would probably do is write two names on two stones, shake them and roll them, and, and the first one to come out, the first one to turn face up would be we believe that's a sovereign act of God, that he's chosen this man. Nothing, nothing wrong between the two men. It's just clearly who the Lord had chosen. So just as review, the church was gathering for one purpose. That was prayer. The disciples were praying with one mind. They were asking God for one man and that uh, this man would have one quality, that he had walked with Jesus, and this man would do one job. So here's the application portion of the message, and that is uh, ultimately... Uh, why I came here as your pastor, because I'm praying for one. Uh, and the, it's the last thing that, one of the last things that Dustin Webb, who we now support as a missionary down in Peru, it's one of the last things he said to me while I was still at Buffalo Creek, was he said, man, get one more. And we had talked before about what we meant by that. And it was for Dustin, his testimony would be that he had sat in the church service, um, you know, for his whole life, had heard plenty of great sermons, the call to missions and the call to be saved, but he said it never turned on as personal. And so here's the point of the message today. When we're saying that the church was praying for one, I believe that the church is still praying for that one man, for that one woman. And what I hope that you would hear today in the message is that what we're praying for, maybe it's you. 
Maybe that today the light would come on and you would realize that I'm the person who is called to ministry. I'm the person who is called to be a witness. I'm the person who's called to walk closely and intimately with Christ. And if you're trying to do some type of ministry from a secondhand knowledge of Jesus, it will always fail. But my hope and my prayer for this church and my time here is that there would be one each week that, that I, I hope that'd be my attitude, that I would pray, Lord, would you save one person this week? Would you have one person that the light bulb turns on and they realize I must know him and make him known? Think about Paul. Paul wasn't looking at ministry like someone else could do it. Paul was saying, I implore you, we implore you, we beg you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled. The church in America, what it needs is people to begin to take personal responsibility. It's not enough for us to say there are people who never heard the name of Jesus. We have to get to the point that we say, why have I not gone? And why have I not helped send people? You see, that's the, it's the danger of us gathering that it's the danger when an accident happens and there's a group of, stand, of people standing by that eventually somebody will say, well, someone will step up. I hope we raise the type of men and women that say, I will step up. If we're looking for one person, pastor, let it be me. I mean, ultimately, what does it mean to be the one? How would you know if you were the one? Here's what I would tell you. Begin to take personal responsibility. First for yourself. You cannot know a secondhand Christ and then secondly, begin to take personal responsibility for your family. That you would say the worst thing that could happen is for my children not to love the Lord. This is why it's a qualification in, in, for the ministers that they would have children who loved the Lord because it means that the person took personal responsibility to his family. In fact, I thought about preaching and telling the message of James Dobson. I'll, I'll share it just briefly, even though I don't have the specifics in my notes, is that James Dobson, his, his father was a great revival preacher. James Dotson was causing some troubles as a young man, so his mama called his father and said, I need you to come home. And he said, let me finish the revival. And she said, no, I mean, I need you to come home. James is run amok. He's not seeking the Lord. He, ha he cares nothing about the righteousness of God. And so Dr. James Dobson, focus on the family. His ministry began because his father left the ministry and said, I'll focus on my son. So this great ministry that America has been blessed by was because a father said, instead of chasing everyone, I'll chase one. And look at how the world was impacted. There has to be a moment that we take personal responsibility. It's not enough that the world is lost and dying. Here's what um, uh, Charles Spurgeon said. He said this, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, begging them to stay, begging them to be saved. Let no one go unwarned. Let no one go unprayed for. You know what we're trying to do as a church? We're hoping each week, we're praying each week that as God's word is delivered, that people won't say that was a good message, but people will say, oh, it hurt, but I'm the one who needed it. I'm the one. Ultimately, how do you listen do you listen as if you're Matthias? Am I the one? Or do you listen, do you get lost in the ambiguity of the crowd? I, I told the first service, one of the worst preachers I ever heard, uh, we asked him to come out to this camp, great guy, loves the Lord, not called to preach. Uh, and somebody else had recommended him. I was actually the camp director. Said, yeah, man, let's have him come out. And he preached his first sermon and you know he's supposed to preach like seven or eight sermons. So after that first one, it's like, Oh, mama, it's going to be a long week. And uh, so I, we, we began to talk and, and um, share about what preaching, you know, how to craft something to draw people and to, to give a charge, all of that. He preached a message by the end of the week that is probably one of the best sermons I ever heard. And the sermon was entitled this, What's Worse Than Hell? And the, through the whole sermon, he kept saying, what's worse than hell? And here's how he concluded. You know what's worse than hell? Is watching your friends go there knowing you had the solution, watching your children go there, knowing you had the only hope. You know what it is to be the one. You take personal responsibility. How could I tell of grace if I'd not received it? But if I've received it, how could I not tell of it? And then you take personal responsibility for your family. And then you take personal responsibility for your friends. I don't want to wait and hope someone else will tell them who better in God's sovereignty to share the gospel with my friend than me. Why would I wait? 
And I take personal responsibility for my coworkers and for my community. If someone needs to step up and declare the gospel, why not be me? You're probably familiar with the name D.L. Moody. Uh, I, I don't know if you've heard of him. I, surely you have. He's one of the greatest revival preachers America has ever known. He, he started a school with his name, the Bible, Moody Bible Institute, Moody Church in Chicago, a great legacy there. Preached to over four million while he was alive. There are three things that really shaped, uh, made, really made Moody, you could say. One is a Sunday school teacher in 1855 named Edward Kimball. He went into the shoe store where Moody was working, very nervous, went to the back room, to the stock room, shared the gospel with him. At that point, Moody knew Christ personally. He fell in love with Christ. He wanted to be a witness. And so he said, let me, let me teach a Sunday school class. And the pastor of that church said, well, we don't, we don't have a need for you. And he said, I want to teach. I want to tell people what I learned. And so the pastor said, go get a crowd. So the first week he had 13 kids. He, he basically got them off the street and said, come and just sit in this classroom so I could teach. Within three years, he had 1,500 kids. So he began this great ministry. The Civil War happened. He did some phenomenal ministry through that and uh, began to, to pastor a church there in Chicago that eventually then bore his name. Here's the second event that happened. It was in October 8th, 1871. It was the Chicago fire. That Sunday he preached from Matthew 27, verse 22, from Pilate's words, what should I do with Christ? And he gave the message about what you should do with Christ. And at the end, here's how he closed the sermon. He said, please consider Christ. And next week I'll ask, what will you do with Christ? Swanky, who was his musician, the guy who played the piano, traveled with him, began to play a song and they were interrupted as someone came in and said, the city's on fire. The Chicago fire broke out that morning and it was really during the church service that before it even ended, And he said this, uh, three and a half square miles of that city was burned. 300 people died. 100,000 became homeless overnight within a week uh, because of the the destruction there. He said this, I'll never again ask someone to wait. All for always preach today is the day for you to be saved. And then here's the third thing that happened. So first, someone shared the gospel with him and he knew Christ personally. Secondly, because of the fire, he took personal responsibility to say, I must call people to salvation today. And here's the third thing. He went to the United Kingdom in 1872, just a year after the fire began to preach there. I befriended Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite preachers, uh, but it wasn't Spurgeon's words that moved him. In fact, uh, he talked with a, a man named Henry Valerie, and uh, Varley, I'm sorry, uh, who was a British uh, traveling evangelist. Uh, Varley actually went down to Australia, was, was kind of the most famous uh, evangelist in Australia. Anyways, Uh, They're talking in the foyer uh, in Dublin. They're talking in a church foyer. And Varley said something to him that Moody would say changed his life. And he, he went back actually about 12 years later back to England. And he asked Varley, he said, do you remember what you told me? It's changed my life. Varley said, no, what was it? And he said, so here's uh, Moody's words. He said, oh, Mr. Moody said, these are the words that were sent for my soul. They were spoken by you, but they were from the living God. And I, as I crossed back the wide Atlantic, the boards on the deck of the vessel were engraved with your words. And whenever I reached Chicago, the paving stone, every paving stone seemed to be marked with these words, Moody, the world has yet to know what God would do through a man who was fully consecrated to him. He looked at Varley and said, by God's help, I aim to be that man. If I could close the message this way, the early church, Acts chapter one, they're looking for a witness, someone who had walked with Christ, who would testify of the resurrection. And I would tell you today, 2000 years later, the world and the church are still looking for that man. Someone who had walked closely with Christ and to say, I wanna take personal responsibility to be a witness. If you're here today, you've never trusted Christ. I I pray that today, would be the day. Today, you would be the one, whether you're joining us online or listening here in the pew, that you would hear the gospel and that you would say, I need to repent of my sins. Yes, Christ died for sinners, but I'm the worst. I need a savior. And maybe here, you're here today and you're saved. Maybe your cry would be, oh, I wanna walk so closely with the Lord that I can't help but be a witness. The world is in desperate need. of one. 
Father, we ask that today you'd speak to our hearts. Father, for the people that are lost that hear this message, would your Holy Spirit crawl all over them? Would you break them of their sin and their wickedness? Father, you know how blinded we are to our own sins. You know how we love truth as long as it doesn't offend us or hurt us. Father, for those who are stuck in sin, who've never found the Savior, who've never truly looked in faith and repented of their sins, Father, today would you convict them. And Father, for those people who are followers, Father, would you draw us into an intimate relationship with you? May we know you deeply. And Father, would we be so moved by knowing you that we declare you in your goodness? We love you, Father. Would you move in our hearts? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.